Tonight's scripture is from John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been laying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Then she said, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For, uh, for whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me it. Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said all these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I know you just heard this story, uh, but I'm going to rehearse it just a little bit more with you. So bear with me. Mary had had quite a three-day stretch. Uh, She had heard the crowds go from crying Hosanna, uh, and she heard those cries turn to crucify him, crucify him. She had stood watching as her beloved Lord Jesus was tortured and killed. And that was Friday. Saturday was her Sabbath day. No work was to be done. No travel was allowed. And so, more than likely, she stayed home. Stayed home fretting. Stayed home wondering. Stayed home thinking about what she could do yet for Jesus. We know from other Gospels that she and other women were preparing ointments that were used to, uh, that they would use as soon as the Sabbath was over to anoint his body for a proper burial. When Mary arrived at the tomb that morning, the stone had already been rolled back, and she ran uh, to Simon Peter and the other disciple that Jesus loved, and she told them that the body was gone. Peter and the disciple ran to the tomb, and they saw that it was empty. And we're told that at least the one who arrived first and went in second believed. Believed what? We're not quite sure. Believed that the tomb was empty? I think that's about as far as it went. For Peter and this other disciple then went home. But Mary lingers. Mary has been thinking about this moment now for three days, and she stays behind, still more than likely fretting. She sees two angels, and they ask, Woman, why are you weeping? And her answer, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. As soon as she said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus 
But she didn't know that it was him. She said, and he said, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, stop the tape, cut, stop. This is where we're going to pause. Supposing him to be the gardener. I want to do a little survey right now. How many of you assume that this is a wrong assumption on Mary's part? Was she right in assuming that Jesus is the gardener or was she wrong? Wrong? Raise your hand. Was Jesus the gardener? What? I don't know. Just take a chance. Was Jesus the gardener? If you think so, raise your hand. Was he the gardener? What? If you think he was the gardener, that her assumption, her assumption was correct. Now raise your hand if you think she was wrong, her assumption was wrong. Yeah, okay. This is what I suspected, that most of you are in the same place I was for a long, long time. Every previous time that I have read John's Gospel account, I've rushed over this this phrase, supposing him to be the gardener. And until this year, uh, supposing him to be the gardener, I think is exactly, is the exact supposing and and the exact assumption that we need. I believe this Uh, is one assumption that John, the author of this gospel, wants us to consider and to consider deeply. I think John wants us to wonder, what if Mary is right, that he is the gardener? Early on the first day of the week, think about this, early uh, early on the first day of the week, that's how chapter 20 starts, early on the first day of the week, while it's still dark. Nothing had arisen. The only things that were uh, awake and alive seemed to be Mary and what is still yet unknown, Jesus. So I'm going to read, now with those words in mind, I'm going to read uh, a little bit from Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. In the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens, when no plants of the field yet, uh, was yet in, in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, the Lord, for the Lord God had not caused rain to come upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water, would, uh, and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a what? A garden. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden. In the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed out of the ground. The Lord God made to grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. God planted a garden. God is the original master gardener, is he not? God planted a garden. God brought forth vegetation. God placed humankind into the midst. Not to be over it in chapter 2. In chapter 1 we get this idea of dominion. But in chapter 2 God placed the human in, in the midst of the garden. Uh, to be part of it, to keep it, to bless it. So now on the first day of the week, while it's still dark, again, nothing had risen, Mary stands at the crossroads between dark and light, between chaos and order, between death and life. She sees Jesus. Now here's what I really can't figure out, is why did Mary assume that Jesus was the gardener? Did the gardener or the, the groundskeeper live in a, in a little shack in the, in the garden? And he was suddenly startled by her presence and ran out of his hut naked? I mean, think about it. The, the clothes, the grave cloth that Jesus had been draped in were left in the tomb. Was he in the garden naked this morning? And she thinks, oh my, we disturbed the gardener and got him out of bed. 
Or here's another possibility. Maybe the gardener uh, used that empty tomb as a place to keep a, a change of clothes. So when Jesus arose that morning, hmm, this is the right fit. He put on the gardener cl- gardener's clothes and was just kind of hanging out in the garden. I really don't know why she thought he was the gardener. But she did. We just don't know. But she assumes that he is a gardener. And again, I think John wants us to wonder if maybe she's not right. Jesus says to to her, Mary, and you can almost see it in bodily movement. If you... you, If you invite yourself to get a picture in your mind of Jesus there in the garden, Mary hearing her name, she suddenly drops to the ground in awe and wonder, and she reaches out to touch his feet, and he says, Do not hang on to me yet, for I am not ascended to my Father. But go and tell. He says, Go and tell my brothers. Go and tell my brothers what you have seen. And you can again, you can almost picture it that, that he takes her by the hand and he lifts her up. Mary is like a, a seed planted in the garden. She falls to the earth. She falls to the ground in worship and awe and, and amazement. And Jesus lifts her up. He takes her by the hand and says, Do not hold on to me yet, for I am not ascended, but go. And so she goes. She goes obediently. She goes uh, energetically, she goes faithfully and she shares with the brothers that, that, that she has seen Jesus, that he is alive. And she bears fruit. She bears fruit in that moment for the kingdom of God. It's a beautiful moment if you think about it. It's a beautiful illustration of what God wants from you and me who are also uh, part of God's garden. God wants us who are, who are of the dust within our very being. He wants us to grow. He wants us to, to be uplifted. And He wants us to go forth and bear fruit to honor and praise God's holy name. And here's another reason why I think that Mary is right, that Jesus is the gardener. Because to be a gardener, you have to believe in what? You have to believe in resurrection. To plant that seed in the earth, you have to believe that even in its death it will rise up. Even in its death it will rise up and it will grow and it will bear much fruit. Jesus tells us that in John chapter 12. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single great grain. But when it dies, it grows up and it bears much fruit. Jesus has just experienced resurrection for himself. Jesus believes in resurrection, not only for himself, but he believes in resurrection for those who are around him. He believes in resurrection for Mary. She's already experienced it once in her life. Jesus transformed her life. She was a woman with with a mixed history according to different Gospels, but some Gospels say that she... She had demons. Some Gospels say that she was a woman of the street. Regardless of who she was or what she was, Jesus has transformed her life where she is at the tomb this morning ready to serve Him in any way she can even when she thought that He was yet dead. And in her faithfulness, Jesus raises her up and he, He enables her to become part of His garden that bears fruit, part of His garden that brings glory and honor to God's name, part of His, his garden that, that, that overflows with abundance. That is who Mary is. I believe that Jesus is the gardener, that He stands now in the place where God stood in Genesis chapter 2. Jesus stands in that place of being the master gardener. He is there to tend to the creation. He is there to tend to that creation that is always being made new. Our, our church, the ELCA, has a slogan, always being made new. 
This is the gift of Jesus. It's the gift of Easter that you and I are made new. We are made new and our lives are given meaning and purpose. We are called to bear fruit no matter what uh, no matter what we have done, no matter uh, who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter uh, what you've done, there is always grace, there is always forgiveness, there is always new life, and we are always being made new as we are in relationship with Jesus Christ, our gardener and our Lord. This is the first of a three-week series about Jesus as gardener. And tonight we celebrate just this simple truth that Jesus is the one who brings new life. That he is the one that that helps us to believe in resurrection. He is the one who helps us believe that we can be made new, that, that that our neighbor can be na- made new, that our relationships can be made new, that, that our world, our crea- this, the, the, the world around us can be made new. Next week, we're going to look at the ecology of God's garden. What does God's garden look like? What are the characteristics of that garden? And then the third week, we will consider how we have been gifted and how we are called to... Uh, to invest ourselves and our gifts in God's work, in in God's work of making all things new. And so, my friends, I want you this week to think about Jesus as the gardener of your life, how he has planted you, how he is lifting you up and making you new so that your life can be used in his mission. Amen.